Well, welcome everyone to our 2022 Mesoamerican Reef Health Report Card Essentials. Uh, thank you for joining us in this virtual event. Uh, you as partners are crucial for this report card. Uh, thank you to the media that has always helped us reach the audiences to bring the message of the Mesoamerican Reef Conservation. So first I want to do some housekeeping. So please keep your mics muted. Um, interpretation is available. So the ones that need that, you click on the icon that seems like a world in the lower right part of your screen. Los que necesiten traducción pueden activarla en el icono eh, del mundito donde dice interpretación. Ahí escogen el idioma que necesitan. Um, so please click the language that you need. Um, you can place your questions in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Pueden poner todas sus preguntas en el chat y las vamos a ir contestando cuando acabemos la presentación, por favor. And at the end as well, you can raise your hand with the reactions button to take a turn to ask questions. Y también al final pueden alzar su mano con el icono de reacciones para tomar turnos para las preguntas y respuestas. Um, so now I want to present our team that will lead you through the regional results and urgent actions to preserve our reef. So first of all, Melanie McField, our director. Uh, Melina Soto, Mexico coordinator. Nicole Craig, Belize coordinator. Ana Giro, Guatemala coordinator. Ian Dreisdell, Guatemala coordinator. And myself, Marisol Rueda, communications consultant. So thank you for joining and Melanie, we can start. Okay, thank you. I will share screen and begin to share with you our latest report card essentials. Okay, let me go full screen. Okay, hopefully everyone sees this. And um, just to let you know, this is the first time we have tried, um, we're kind of preempting ourselves with giving you the main results in a fashion that is, uh, we're, it's about six months since we've been out of the water. So this data collection stopped in like December and we really want to try to push the timeline and get this information because we feel like we're sitting on it and it's really urgent and needs to be out there. So we do have a full report that will have more analysis and more words, but this is the version, less words, more action. We really want to get the conversation started about what we can do to um, deal with some of the problems that are identified in this report. So big picture, 10,000 foot view, looking at the one reef health index score for the entire Mesoamerican reef over time. We started this in 2006, was the first year of data collection region-wide, and the reef health index was 2.3 out of five. And it gradually increased increased up to 2014 and 16. Those data surveys were produced in a 2.8, which was fair. And we felt good that for a decade of improvement, we had so slowly been able to improve the health of the reef. And then the last two assessments, it has fallen. It went to a 2.5 and then now to a 2.3, which is back to where we started. So. so threshold values, again, these have not changed. I've just put them up to remind you, this is what the reef health index is based on. It's four key indicators of reef health, coral cover, fleshy macroalgae, herbivorous fish biomass, and commercial fish biomass, which is the two families, the groupers and the snappers. The herbivores are the two families of parrotfish and acanthurids. So these, and the color scheme is standard. So when you see red, that's critical. Um, orange is poor, yellow fair, green good, and blue very good. So we want to see less red and more blue. Overall, um, these percentages, the bar graphs that are here on the, on the main water of the page can kind of give you a quick glance. This is the number of sites. So every site is then ranked with those four indicators. And that 1.5 scale for the reef health index, each and every site gets one of those grades. So the grading scheme is over here. You can see the blue circles are what we want and the red squares are what we don't want. We see a lot more red squares than blue circles. 
You can also look at the distribution of sites in each country. Um, each country had a different number of um, uh, samples, the sites that were surveyed based on how much reef there is and how, how well they could get out. This was all done last summer into fall and still some COVID restrictions and problems. So we didn't have quite as many sites, 234 sites overall this year as we did in the last two assessments. But the big picture is that we got 44% less good and very good, and we have twice as many critical sites. So this is the message that we wanna get out and get everyone collaborating on what we can do about this. Zooming in a little more carefully, um, you can see the one good site here in Cozumel within the protected area that's been fully protected for decades. And they have a sprinkle of sites um, that are good and fair within Mexico. And, but their, their overall reef health was really brought up by Cozumel. Um, they, Chinchorro is the one place that's still free of the stony coral tissue loss disease in Mexico, um, but their lack of fish in that area is also kind of affecting their reef health score. Looking down into the Southern Mar, we go through Belize. You can see a big difference in the Southern that half of Central and then the rest of the South, just having a lot more, it's all kind of solid red and, and orange, so poor and critical. A few good sites are right here off in the Belize, northern part of the central barrier and on Terneff has a lot of um, fair and some out here too in Lighthouse. Guatemala is, is poor and critical and this has been kind of the characteristic, but we're hoping as the time frame of the protection at Cayman Crown, we could begin to see some fish coming back in this area and hopefully increase that. The coral cover is good, but um, fish has been the main problem there. And Bay Islands has a diverse mixture of good, fair, and poor and critical. Looking at these just quickly, um, each indicator over time. So now this is a 15 year time span. So it's a really good, um, it's a good sample. So you can understand what has been going on in coral cover since this first sample, which admittedly was after a number of hurricanes had come through in 2005 was a pretty bad hurricane year, but we have seen recovery. So that is the good news. Um, we're at 19% this year. We would only need to increase 5%. A 5% increase would get us to the good score, which is 20. We want to get to very good, which is 40. But you know, this is the piece of good news that our corals have not completely tanked. We will talk about um, species distributions and maybe we're getting more of the weedy species. That'll be in the full report. We'll get more into details on this. But the other piece of the benthic story, the, you know, the reef bottom itself is fleshy macroalgae. And of course we want less of that to be in our, in our reef. It's persistently been a problem over time and you know, it continues. It's now at 22%. So that's an increase of a couple percent from last time. If we want to get this to good, that will require 77% decrease in the amount of fleshy macroalgae. So this is something that we're going to be talking about. You know, all the countries have their own trajectories, but it's kind of been this stable creep up. And this is what a lot of the interventions that we'll be talking about more in the full report will go into more detail on this and the causes and the preventions. Herbivorous fish, this is something that Namar has gotten a lot of attention for globally. We did a really good thing in 2009 in Belize, 2010 in the, all of the Bay Islands, and then 15 in um, Guatemala and 18 in Mexico. We are getting protection for these fish and we were beginning to see that after the laws were enacted, begin to see increases. And then we had this strange decline the last time in um, Honduras and this time in Belize, going here from um, that 2744 down to 1313 in the biomass of um, herbivorous fish. So, you know, something's going on, like in, in Mexico, in Honduras, when this happened in the last report card, it was attributed to lack of enforcement just due to kind of general decline in, in law enforcement in, in the country overall. And this time it's probably more related to COVID and restrictions, but this is part of what we wanted to do in the release of this is get people thinking about what what are the causes and what is going on with these, these data that we see. I mean, the data are the data. And this is the one that's really most um, alarming. So the critical fish, um, the 
the commercial fish are critical in three of the four countries. You can see these right here. Only Mexico is out of the red zone right now. And you know, we had a point in time when everything was it was looking a lot better. Guatemala has traditionally been kind of down in this zone and they have a small reef area and getting replenishment is probably just gonna start now that they have now created a, a no-take zone within the reef area of Guatemala. But this, this decline in Belize is like one of the largest we've seen. And it is, you know, only Mexico is what's keeping us out of being in critical condition with regards to the snappers and groupers. The average overall is like, a, this is like half of a kilogram of fish per 100 meters squared. Um, we need to have a 142% increase just to reach the score of good. So that's, that's a lot. And, you know, in order to do that, we have to kind of change the way we're doing things. Something has to dramatically change to avoid, to shift this in the other direction. So where are the, all the fish? Where did they go? Well, where we can find them still is in the fully protected zones. And this means actually complete protection. So we have defined these as absolutely no, no fishing. These are the zones where um, there's no sports fishing, no catch and release, no fishing of lobster. In Mexico, they had some zones that were no fishing of fish, but allowed lobster. So this is absolute no fishing. And you can see that the um, biomass is much higher um, in these, the number of sites differ. So this was 51 sites compared to the highly protected, which allows some fishing, like mostly catch and release, maybe some subsistence fishing. The general use zone of the MPA, um, you know, has maybe some requirements that are um, additional licensing gear, like no nets or spear guns, that's often a regulation in general use zones compared to outside. So you can see that the outside the MPA completely is lower for both these families of fish. And they both have the same pattern, which was interesting. And we don't fully understand why the highly protected zones are lower than the general use zone. It may be due to, we're gonna look at more of the country um, specifics because these are mainly in Belize, the highly protected. That's just a term that ended up being more, Belize has a lot of zones that allow the catch and release and the other countries don't. And like this is none of that is Mexico because theirs is all in <laughs> marine protected area this big marine protected area basically takes up all of Mexico. So all the sites in Mexico are within MPA just about. So this is what it looks like when, uh, by this definition of um, full protection, we want to see more pink and we've been recommending 20% to be full protection. And you can see by the very small area here that that's, we're not getting close to 20% and they're mostly really tiny areas. And so there are a few larger areas that are probably serving to replenish, but we need to have more and I can show you the statistics. Oh, the definitions, yes. So we are saying no fishing, no extraction, no damaging activities, that's fully protected and highly protected allows some fishing. And these kind of correspond to, you can look at these um, in the prohibited column of the IUCN um, updated guidelines from 2019. It says that you know this would be no extraction, no fishing in these categories, 1A, 1B, 2, and 3. So there is some you know, discussion about these IUCN categories, but it does seem to um, equate to those. Zooming in on the maps, you can see a little more. We also have the table here, so you can see the square kilometers that we've counted in this. If our numbers differ from some you've seen a little bit, it might be that we did exclude all of the land. So if you just took the whole water area and then you compared the amount that's protected, we exclude the land, the islands, all the little bits of land. So it does tend to make it both the denominator and the numerator a little smaller. But ne Mexico um, has 3.1 in full protection. Looking at the Southern Mar, we can see that Belize, we have 1.5% in full protection and 10.6 uh, in highly protected. So adding those two numbers together, together gives you 12.1%, which is similar to what the government of Belize and like some other reports you see talking about no take zone, it's due to their definition, including these two. So that is not totally 
um, different from the other things we have seen. Our territorial C might be a little different. Some versions are still using the older territorial C that cut out here. But um, after the repeal of the Maritime Areas Act, this territorial C went back to that. So that increased the area of territorial C a bit. Guatemala now has the highest uh, percent in full protection at 11.7, just since 2020 when that recent declaration of this large no take zone came in crown. And Honduras has 2%. It's almost all out here in Swan Islands, which we know is not really enforced. So that's a bit of a problem. All of their zones here did allow some fishing. There's a bit on Utila, which is good. But overall then we've got you know, 54%, so we have a lot in protection in marine protected area. But when you look at what is real protection in terms of no fishing at all, no extraction, it's 2.4%, which is not enough. So my last slide is just to show you the reef health index. You can see the, the colors, remember, for the, each of these different components, the four components. Coral's doing better across the board. Commercial fish is critical in three of the four countries. And overall, Mexico having the highest reef health index this year with 2.8 followed by Honduras 2.3, Belize 2.0, and Guatemala 1.8. So now we're going to let each of the coordinators give you a quick overview of the country and what they're seeing in their country results. So Melina Soto will go first for Mexico. Thank you very much, Melanie. So yeah, as you've been uh, saying, um, this year we have again a reef health index of 2.8. So this is like several uh, report cards in a row that we maintain that uh, reef health index, but really uh, it's inside it, the different indicators are, are moving. And for this year, it's really basically due to a very good fish biomass, herbivorous and commercial, uh, essentially in Cozumel, in the other areas of uh, Mexico, uh, all these um, fish biomass are pretty low. Uh, after a decade of um, a small improvement in coral cover, uh, we now see a decrease of 25%. We now have 12% of coral cover overall as a, as a country, and this is mainly due to the impacts of uh, the stony coral tissue loss that had, hit, that had hit us very strongly since 2018. Uh, as I was saying, the herbivorous and commercial fish biomass are still in fair condition overall, uh, but uh, we have an increase of uh, almost 33% of uh, fleshy macroalgae, uh, reaching now 24% um, uh, in cover. Our coral cover of 12 is um, still fair, but 73% of it is represented by opportunistic or low uh, calcifying uh, coral species, which is also very um, of worrying. And for our fish, um, well, the majority of it was uh, small. It was more than 70% of our, lab, our uh, fish measured was, were less than 20 centimeters. So uh, dominated by small um, uh, species and small individuals, right? So without Cozumel, without the fish of Cozumel and without um, um, yeah, the fish of Cozumel, our indicator really will be 2.3. And our highest coral cover was uh, in Chinchoro with 18%. This is our national best. So we remain, but it's not all good news. So now I will uh, give the mic uh, to my colleague from Belize, Nicole Craig, uh, the Belize coordinator. Hello. So. All right, so Belize's score for this year is 2.0, and that's a poor rank, and our largest decline in 15 years. And this unfortunately comes right after the country's highest score of 3.0 from the last report card, which was um, fair. So most alarming is our commercial fish biomass that declined 60%, and that's now in critical condition overall. And it's critical in five of six of our subregions. Our coral cover increased by 1%, and that's been on a slow 1% at a time increase 
for the last few report cards, but as you just heard from Melina, the composition or the types of corals that we're seeing are not necessarily um, the majority of the larger reef building species. And then during this reporting period as well, we were hit with SCTLD and that's impacting four of our six subregions. But our National Coral Reef Monitoring Network is actively working to treat and monitor. So our efforts are showing some promising results. Um, fleshy macroalgae declined by 1%. And just like, like coral cover, it was slowly declining at a 1% pace over the last few reports. But it is actually still in fair condition. It's too high. It's 18%. And this slow decline would probably be impacted by now the reveal of this decrease in herbivorous fish in Belize. We saw a uh, over 50% decline um, and it's actually in critical condition in the Southern barrier and global, Glover's Reef Atoll, sorry. And this subregion, the Northern barrier complex was the only one to see an increase in herbivorous fish and that subregion includes Key Cocker, San Pedro, Bacalar, Chico Marine Reserve. Um, next, we're gonna hear from the Guatemalan coordinator, Ana. Thank you, Nicole. So for Guatemala, we have um, the lowest reef health index. So it decreased from two to 1.8. So it's the lowest in, in all of the mar. Um, and this is mostly due because of the lack of herbivorous fish and commercial fish biomass and the increasing fish microbiology. So we do have a good coral cover. It remains in good condition with 28%. And this is mostly due to the high values that we have in one of our reefs that Melanie was talking about earlier in the Cayman Crown. So fleshy macroalgae has reached critical, critical levels. It has a historical increase from 19% in 2018 to 30% in 2021. So this lowers our, our reef health index as well, and also the biomass of commercial and herbivorous fish that continue to decrease from an already critical condition. If you see when Melanie presented the graphs, we have the herbivorous fish and the commercial fish already in critical, but now it has lowered even more. Um, so water quality is one, that we have bad water quality on our reef. So this is why we have this increase in fresh macroalgae, but also the lack of fish. So we need to bring back our fish and also um, improve the water quality on our reefs. So now let's hear from Ian Drysdale. He's the Honduran coordinator. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Unfortunately, it also paints a dire picture for Honduras. Our commercial fish are in critical condition. They have remained that way. And unfortunately, as our herbivorous fish biomass decreases, our fleshy macroalgae maintains in critical and it's actually getting worse. We now have the lowest reef health index that we have ever had in Honduras of a 2.3 overall. We have seen that coral cover has also dropped in Honduras, but we can also celebrate that places like the West Coast in Honduras have like the highest live coral cover in the whole Mesoamerican reef. But then our fish, both commercial and herbivorous, have been decreasing in the entire country. We definitely need to create more infrastructure to treat wastewater. And we also need to implement more completely protected zones so that we can protect our fish. We have the coral cover and they can come back, but we do need to work on reducing fishing pressure in many areas and also decrease the amount of fleshy macroalgae that comes in through the lack of wastewater treatment. I'll pass it on now to Melanie McField. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So lastly, I wanna give um, thanks to all of the contributors. There were actually 77 individuals who got in the water and collected this data between, I think it was June and December of last year. Um, here you can see the different organizations that assisted with this and how many sites they contributed. So it's really a concerted collaborative effort to collect all of this data. And now almost all of it, like 95% of it is in the AGRA database, which makes it 
um, available to all of us in its full raw form. It's going to be much more powerful in terms of um, really trying to get deep and understand what's going on, looking at the different sites and zones and habitats. We can do a lot more with this data and we're encouraging all of you who helped collect it to um, get it, work with us, work with others, find academic partners, and let's keep exploring this data. There's a lot more to learn. This is, this is the really broad brush um, result that you've just been given, but there's so much more to be learned and gleaned from this. So in addition to the team that you've met today, we have Israel Munoz, who's working with us um, in, he has just finished his PhD from Sinbetsa. And then Patricia Kramer and Lynette Roth did amazing job in really getting this data all together in about three months from the time the data came in, maybe less, a little less than three before we presented it at the partner meeting in um, February. So we have kind of double checked it and we added about 15 more sites from Belize, from sorry, Mexico that are not in this database, but it filled spatial gaps that were available from scientists that had the data. So with that, we completed this in record time. So getting, getting the report out in like six months, it is the brief version, the essentials, but we will be relying on all of you, all of the partners to really help us get the word out and use this to, you know, use this result to help spur discussions about what can be done. I think we all agree that what we want is to improve reef health. We see where the problem points are and we can discuss a variety of different opportunities for um, actions that can deal with it. But basically we need these actions to be implemented now. It's a little frustrating, um, you know, we have been, recommending this 20% in full protection every report card, you know, since the 2008 report card. So every single one has made this recommendation and we're just still not getting there. We're at 2.4% regionally. So I feel like, you know, we also need strategy from some of our partners that do a lot of campaigns and help figure out what, what are we doing wrong? I mean, the effort is amazing and we're collaborating and we're producing these reports, but yet we need to get the results. So we do need to get this to the 20% full protection. I think that, you know, looking at these fish numbers, the longer we wait, the more challenging it will be to ever be able to replenish and bring back those fish. And that said, um, massive coastal developments are gonna impact water quality and nursery habitat for these fish. And then inadequate sewage treatment, we know we've been talking about this, working to try to get improvements that will reduce the nutrients and the pathogens, the coral disease. Now we have the diadema disease that's ravaging. Um, I think we need to clean up the waters. And these are the things, let's keep it simple, three things. Let's just work together to do these things and help improve the health. So we want to close so we can take questions and have a discussion from all of you. And I'll stop sharing. Marisol will take over and field the questions. Thank you, Melanie. And there are, are a couple of questions, one from Fernando Sakaira that was already answered in the, in the chat box, but Melina, if you want to explain. Yeah, so from the 60 sites we have, uh, eight are from Cozumel. So you imagine like the, the load, <laughs> how it's um, um, like taking up the, the, the average, how like better these uh, data are from consumer. We, it's where the only very good site of the whole region is. It's where two of the four good sites of Mexico um, are also. But as I was saying, uh, however, uh, it's mainly uh, influenced by the fish biomass because uh, their um, coral cover, which was um, pretty high, well, which was fair before, uh, has almost um, um, de um, declined for about 40% um, from, last, from last report card, right? Which was just at the beginning of the stony coral tissue loss disease um, impact. So, so yes, uh, the, these eight sites uh, bring up uh, our average. And, uh, and, and this is very interesting, and that's what we were also um, talking about, uh, because um, Chinchoro um, 
is as as the so doesn't have doesn't show the stony coral tissue loss disease and as now the highest uh, coral cover of our region uh, with 18 percent but it's uh, fish biomass are very low and their uh, fleshy microalgae are very high also so the difference because they are both um um, in protected areas, etc. They, they a lot of uh, they have a lot of um, no fishing uh, zones, etc. So um, we think that also one of the main um, reason for that difference between um, the fish is that in 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 Cozumel, there's so many eyes in the water. Uh, there is uh, there is pretty good enforcement, and there is uh, also a lot of participation from the community. Um, because people there um, directly depend on, on, on the beauty uh, because of the diving industries, etc. And there's like um, local brigades, etc. of um, um, vigilancia uh, to, that are uh, looking and um, taking care of each other. And, and instead in Chinchoro, well, they have um, um, very few people working there, very, very few um, um, fishermen, the fishermen that are doing uh, the, the things right, uh, also report there's a, a lot of illegal fishing there. So yeah, this is uh, very uh, interesting, the difference between the, the different regions, but mainly for the coastal area, it's uh, all in, in poor and critical um, situation, very low everything. Oh, and hi, my colleagues. Thank you, Melina. We have another question for Ana from Guatemala. Um, no soy experto en el tema, pero ¿qué repercusiones negativas tiene ese índice para Guatemala y cómo se puede recuperar? ¿Hay conciencia de esta situación negativa en el gobierno? De Jorge Mazariegos. Ana, hasta que respondiste en el chat, pero si puedes... Sí, sí, respondí, ajá, respondí una parte, pero la parte eh, en, la cuanto, en cuanto a, re, a repercusiones negativas, eh, pues sí no repercute porque, por ejemplo, no hay peces, ¿no? Y entonces esto repercute en también la pesca y en, y en las comunidades costeras. Eh, una baja en nuestro índice significa que tenemos pues una recife, una recife que no está sano. Entonces, algo positivo es de que tenemos una buena cobertura de corales vivos. Entonces, esto significa que, que tenemos, por ejemplo, la estructura para que vivan ahí lo, los organismos como peces y otros organismos asociados al arrecife. Sin embargo, sí nos hace falta mejorar nuestra calidad del agua eh, y también reducir la presión pesquera en algunos sitios estratégicos eh, donde tenemos las zonas arrecifales. Eh, entonces, bueno, yo contesté algo también acá en el chat y es básicamente, sí, nosotros pues trabajamos eh, muy de cerca con, con el gobierno, eh, pero sí falta, faltan acciones para poder realmente tener un manejo adecuado y para mejorar nuestra calidad del agua, porque esto lo hemos estado viendo pues, ya de hace muchos años, ¿no? El manejo de cuencas, ma eh, tener un adecuado manejo del tratamiento de las aguas residuales en la zona costera es muy importante. Entonces, pues esto también mejoraría nuestra calidad del agua y, y por lo tanto reduciría la cantidad de macroalgas en el arrecife y tendríamos más corales. Eh, pero sí, básicamente hace falta más acciones, de acuerdo. Muchas gracias, Ana. Uh, we have one more question from Fernando Secaira. Uh, when you were talking, Melina, uh, how strong is the link between water pollution and the occurrence of the recent diseases? Is it a hypothesis or with, same, or with some data? As diseases are so terrible now, we must act against them. Critical to know the source. And he's also congratulating us for the information that it's very well presented. Thank you, Fernando. So Melina, if you want to answer him. Thank you. Yes, it's very difficult uh, because we still don't really um, have uh, isolated the pathogen for the social uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, at first, it was thought to be uh, bacteria or group of bacteria, but now uh, the hypothesis is uh, more oriented uh, towards uh, a virus that, are, that is affecting um, the symbiont and the, the relation between the, the coral and the symbiont. So this is 
very um, complex, uh, but this is not the only disease, right? Uh, some of the other diseases that cause um, sulfur have been linked to human pathogens. And in, an, in overall, it's just um, speaking of reducing those uh, stress uh, source, right? Because the, the water quality will, um, well, um, release uh, so many nutrients and pathogens and, and, and leave the, the communities, the coral communities, the fish communities in that um, caldo, <laughs> in that um, environment um, full with, um, with stressors. So it's all about reducing stressors so the, the organisms are more resilient uh, on their own. So yes, I think there's still not like a direct link to uh, human uh, pollution, but it's always after, like it, it has started after uh, the dredging of the Miami port. And then it's always linked to the beginning, at least of the, um, of the diseases, almost always linked to, to big ports, et cetera, to big cities, et cetera. So, and then it spreads right to other areas. So, so yeah, it's not that simple of a link, but definitely it's part of the issue. Yeah, and do you want to say something else about this? Yes, thank you, Marisol. What we can say for sure in Honduras, specifically in Roatan, is that the one site that we monitor that is at the outfall of the West End wastewater treatment plant shows fewer coral diseases than sites surrounding it. So at least we can pinpoint that having an adequately run wastewater treatment plant in this one community has made a difference in the reef adjacent to where this treated water goes into the ocean. And like Melina says, there's, we can't really tell about a direct relationship, but when we look at the data specifically for West End in Roatan, we do see a complete and very clear reduction in coral diseases in that area. So taking everything else into account, we know that this is making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, we have one more question from Zachary. Um, I guess this can go to Nicole, but anyone else can answer as well. It's a, a problem for all the four countries. Uh, Zachary says, is it proven that sargassum negatively has any part to play what we want to accomplish? I think Nicole is frozen. Does anyone else want to answer this one? Well, I mean, I would just say in general, you know, the sargassum link to poor water quality is, you know, it's there. It's just a link, kind of a correlative link. So yes, it as that washes in, it grows when there's more nutrient in the water. It can grow faster as it's floating at sea. And then once it gets into your coastal environment on your beach, it's rotting, decaying materials, contributing even more nutrients and sometimes even to the point of depleting oxygen and having little pills under it. So it's a problem in terms of water quality, but not really, you know, it's not at all of these reef levels and most of the reef um, luckily is kind of um, underneath it. So it passes over and it affects the beach and it affects really along the coastline. But you know, to say that the sargassum is like the reason for the, the fleshy macroalgae blooms on the bottom, on the reef bottom, no, not really. It's kind of a different impact. And it's not the cause of the declining fish population. That's like no, no one's come up with a, a conceptual theory that would explain that. So I think, you know, in terms of the fish, we're looking more the direct order of magnitude force on that is fishing pressure. There are other things, global climate change, weather patterns, ocean circulation patterns that can have an impact, but you know, primarily it's fishing pressure on that one. And then nutrients into the environment fueling the macro macroalgae. And more of that is probably coming from like agricultural runoff from the mainland and then localized sewage enhancement, enhancement of you know, growth of these unwanted macroalgae in areas where there's 
sewage outfalls that are not treating the waste. So that one in West End, just to be clear, that, that Ian talked about is where they have done extensive work to um, improve the sewage treatment and they're reaching you know, very low nutrient levels and they're disinfecting everything before it's released. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, hola, Javier. Tenemos una pregunta de Javier. Hola, Marisol. Gracias a todos. Buenas tardes. Primero que nada, felicidades por todo el trabajo. Qué bárbaros. Muchas felicidades. Gracias también por ponerlo así. Lo esencial para empezar a tomar acción. Mi, mi reflexión duda es que para la cobertura en Cozumel particularmente, de corales vivos, está dada sobre todo por Agaricia y por Ipte, si mal no recuerdo. Pero lo que yo no he visto es a los grandes constructores arrecifales de vuelta. O sea, ¿qué, ¿qué tenemos que hacer? O mejor dicho, esto ocurre en otros sitios también, porque mi, mi impresión, mi percepción aquí es que hemos perdido para Cozumel a las grandes o a las especies que construían el arrecife de coral. Entonces, si, si eso se está viendo en otros sitios del SAM, esa sería mi pregunta concreta y pues de ahí empezar a pensar qué más hacemos juntos, ¿verdad? Muchas gracias. Este, puedo contestar, eh, bueno, ya en español, <risa> te puedo contestar este, para México al menos. Eh, sí, eh, he empezado, o sea, he hecho ese cálculo para todo eh, México, ahí sí junté a, a todos los sitios y sí, como te decía, son 73% de la cobertura del coral de México que está representado por este, estas especies oportunísticas o poco calcificadoras como eh, los eh, porites asteroides y eh, las agaricias y, otro, y los demás corales que hacen eh, colonias muy chiquitas. ¿no? Eh, los ramificados, es que no tengo el dato enfrente de mí, pero los ramificados ya a nivel nacional eh, representaban menos del 3%, este, los masivos por ahí del 10%, o sea, sí es, eh, al menos para México, sí es ya una situación eh, que por eso que te decía que eh, bastante preocupante porque aunque al parecer nuestra cobertura de coral pues se mantiene ahí, en realidad hay un cambio en la comunidad que, que sí está eh, pues eso, preocupante y pues eh, ¿qué hacer? Pues <ríe> ahí son diferentes ¿verdad? <ríe> los retos pero bueno, obviamente uno de los eh, pues temas es restauración ¿no? Este, tanto este, sexual Sexual, asexual, para intentar al menos eh, mantener los eh, organismos que seguimos eh, teniendo para ojalá si logramos mejorar la calidad del agua, este, regular eh, más la, la pesca ilegal, etcétera, pues que se puedan eh, reproducir eh, de manera este, pues natural este, estos corales ¿no? y aumentar esta eh, resiliencia. Pero sí es, un, es una situación, al menos aquí en México, sí bastante crítica. No sé si en los otros países ya han hecho ese cálculo de las... Eh, de las especies, de las formas, de, de las comunidades. Sí, o sea, de hecho, bueno, para, para Guatemala, eh, lo que pasa es que no tenemos registros de que, que era, o sea, que el arrecife está compuesto por otras especies más, eh, como más formadoras estructurales, ¿no? Entonces, lo que tenemos de registro, es lo, o sea, son especies, por ejemplo, agaricias, que son las que más dominan. Eh, y así, pero, pero bueno, eh, yo creo que igual es el mismo como trend en todo, en todo el arrecife mesoamericano y se está tratando de ver un poco más de cerca eh, la, la composición de especies, ¿no? Para poder ver cuántas tenemos, ¿no? Que realmente sean constructoras de un arrecife eh, y, y demás, pero ese es para, para Guate, ¿no? Para Guate. Muchas gracias. Eh, Melina, ya contestaste esta eh, de Kaila. Solo la voy a leer. For the disease affecting diadema antillarum, has it been seen yet in the reefs of Mexico? I don't know if you want to share more information, um, but we already uh, shared there the link. Patricia Kramer shared a direct link. So you can uh, keep the trackings in the web page. But Melina, if you want to say something else. 
No, no, that, uh, yes, in Mexico, it has been spotted in, in Cozumel. Uh, as of now, it seems to not be reported uh, anywhere else, but uh, this is something that is spreading also uh, throughout the Caribbean, so we need to be um, well aware. And yes, and it's very useful to report your sightings uh, of um, diarima, but um, not only the dead or sick ones, right? It's also very useful to see to to know where it's still uh, healthy uh, in order to uh, monitor best that uh, that spreading and and to understand maybe the reasons uh, why some uh, populations get sick and others don't, don't. So so yeah, um, you Kaila, that you go uh, diving uh, so often, like uh, keep your eyes open for for that. I know there's not much diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> in Puerto Morelos, but um, yeah, if you if you can report, it's it will be great. And Melina put in the chat. Uh, oh no, I mean Patricia Kramer. She wrote in the chat the direct link for tracking the edema die-offs in the Caribbean. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, I think that's a great tool, and I just encourage everybody to go look at it and the stony coral tissue loss disease tracker as well, and bleaching in case we have bleaching this summer. That one, the disease and bleach watch has been linked together and you can enter your, um, your reports. Also, if, if you have other, you know, I think most of the discussion that we've had is around topics that we will include. We're working now on the additional pages of the report card, looking at the coral species, looking at these other disturbances. So, um, you know, maintain discussions with your healthy reefs coordinators and we can we can continue to talk about this. We are working on the, the full report and we will have more analysis. So just, yeah, keep the conversation going. If there's something you really wanna see, we will be looking at coral species and diadema and more into the um, stony coral tissue loss disease and its impact. But. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Maria Jose. Congratulations for this great work and for calling our attention to the big red flags we have ahead of us. Thank you, Maria Jose. Uh, y un comentario más de, de Rosa María, de amigos de Ciancán, que los invita a descargar el eh, manual Tecnologías para el Desarrollo de un Esquema Integral de Tratamiento de Aguas Residuales en la Península de Yucatán. Para los que estén interesados, dejo el enlace ahí en el chat. Eh, Hane, uh, esta presentación, this presentation will be shared. Uh, yes, uh, it's already in our website. I'm going to share here the links and also the link for a video that we created with the main results. So yeah, I will share in the chat right now. If you have, if anyone has any other questions, please raise your hand or if you can type in in the chat box. Daniel uh, is saying, thanks so much, amazing work. Alguna otra pregunta? Patricia Kramer también nos está compartiendo el link directo para poder eh, poner todas las enfermedades de corales y los reportes de blanqueamiento en el chat. Yo les acabo de enviar en el chat el link al video que hicimos para que lo puedan visitar cuando terminemos esta reunión. Y también les voy a compartir ahora el enlace a la página. Yes, we didn't want to show it to you because we wanted to get you all to be able to look at it so you can stop and pause it if you need to and you can click it and share it. We want to get drive traffic to our YouTube so you can actually you know, we can see how many people are watching it. We want to get this out there. This is the it's an alarm call. So I kind of feel like we're preaching to the converted in this room. You all, you guys are all with us. We're all part of this team that's trying to come up with solutions. So let's, you know, let's get it out there to the rest. I think the dive community is going to be key in getting this. They need to be, you know, louder than our voices in calling for areas of full protection and increasing wastewater and controlling coastal development. But thank you all for being part of it. Fernando también nos comenta que entre las acciones claves se menciona la protección estricta al, al 20% y a la contaminación del agua y que también debemos incluir eh, eh, el manejo pesquero. 
Um, Janelle, um, she says, good morning, everyone. Scary red flags indeed. Are a list of recommended next steps included per country? Melanie, I don't know if you want to answer that. Are we doing that in the report card? Is that the question? In the full report? Yes. Yes. The countries are the countries are going in deeper to their issues and their recommendations. So yes, that will be in the full report. So talk with your country coordinator if you have ideas for what should be what should be included in that. I mean, we did some of that at the partner meeting, but there's definitely room for more discussion and in finalizing those those pages and what it's going to look like. So let's let's spend a couple of weeks like pushing this story and then we'll turn back to the full report and getting all these other details filled out. But I think, you know, ahead of World Ocean Day, I love being positive and I love talking about all the great things, but we also, you know, we need to call it when we see it. And this critical fish biomass, you know, it's if we don't do something now, it's not going to come back. You can create a no-take zone, full protection in a sea that has no fish and there's nothing left to repopulate it. So I'm afraid we're getting critically close to that. You know, we're going to create the full protection zones and they're not going to come back very well because there's nothing around to replenish it. So they themselves need to get have some material. And we've got, you know, only 25 percent of the few groupers and snappers we counted were actually large enough to reproduce. They're just they're getting caught before they're big enough. So that will be another piece of the story in the full report where we're really looking at the size of these fish. And that's the beauty of these full protection zones. They can get big, live old, and produce lots of offspring. Thank you. I think there are no more questions. I just recently shared again the link to our report card so you can download there. There's also a press kit. If we have media people here, you can download our press release and photos. And also I shared the link that's also in that same report card section in our website. Uh, so please uh, take a look. It's a five minute video, very short with our essentials and wait for us for, for the full report card in September. Thank um, you all. Roberto says uh, the report card is still the most effective way to share a lot of data. And there is a stark, the contrast of the biomass of fish in and outside of MPA. Yeah. Thank you, Roberto. Melanie, if you want to close. Okay, yeah, no, thank you all for being a part of this. The work is ongoing. So let's just, you know, raise the alarm in your efforts. This is World Ocean Month, particularly this week. There are a lot of activities going on. And let's, you know, just showing that we recognize a problem and we're working together to solve it. That's the good part of this story. The good part is we have this collaboration in this team and we're constantly monitoring and evaluating what we're doing. So let's let's do a little more and hopefully we'll be able to monitor a good impact of that. So we're with it with you to help in whatever way we can to push the envelope. So in terms of campaigns and strategies, use this report card. It's yours. Tell us what you want to be included in the, the full version because in a couple of weeks we'll be back working on it and we want to get it out. So thank you.